is Angela Yee, your host of a new show by Acorns, where we talk about untold money stories from some of the most inspiring people in the world. What's up? It's Angela Yee, and I'm excited to be bringing you this series with Acorns. And this is important to me because talking about financial wellness, I think, is really critical for everything that we have going on for the future. It's something that I'm trying to get better at, and I want to make sure that we all get better at it. So today, I'm really excited to be sitting down with a friend of mine. And by the way, this is important for him because he's missing out on a lot of money in the time that he's going to be doing this uh, this series about finances, but we are going to be talking to Lenny S. So Lenny S., thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. You know, a lot of times we have conversations and it's never about anything serious. I feel like when I see you, we're always celebrating something. <laughs> it's a dinner, it's an event, and now here we are talking more about Lenny S. and who you are as a person and how affected you are, as we all are, by money. You're right. I feel like we're always toasting or cheersing to something. Right, at we are. Event, <laughs> at a concert, at a party. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So let's uh, dig a little bit into who you are, right? You're from the mm -hmm. Bronx. I'm from the Bronx, where hip-hop was created. I was going to say, some people would case. say. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you didn't know that. No, Bronx created it. You're right. Yes. Brooklyn keeps on taking it. Yeah. I mean, I have you know good Brooklyn people, so I don't want to Yeah, Yeah, calm down. <laughs> So talk to me about growing up in the Bronx and what that was like for you as far as money, because I think a lot of our feelings and thoughts connected with money get established early on in our household. You're absolutely right. I grew up in the Bronx with my mom, a uh, single parent home. Uh, dad was around, but he was uh, he lived in Puerto Rico, uh, remarried. So for the most part, it was my mom and then um, my grandmother, which was my actual my dad's mom. They're the ones who raised me. Mm -hmm. So Monday through Friday, my mom worked. My mom worked two jobs. Regular job during the week, and then she worked on the weekends as like a bartender. Mm -hmm. So when she worked on the weekends at night, I stayed with my grandparents because my dad, again, was in Puerto Rico. Um, but there, those two people, my mother and my grandmother, is uh, whom I learned everything from. Saving money, getting money, not having money, having money, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I got to see a good, um, good perspective from both sides. Like my mom was kind of like struggling, you know, again, single parent home. And my grandmother was like, worked her whole life, and she was pretty... Not say well off, but she she knew how to uh, manage her money well. Like my dad and I used to see people borrow money from my grandmother. So obviously wow. she she managed her money well. Wow, how are you about lending money out? Um, yeah, I mean <laughs> for I've everyone done it. listening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I've done it. You know what I mean? I mean you you got to be there for people for friends. I've had <laughs> friends who've had situations that are you know whether it's like you know court or jail time or you know the uh, rent or about to be evicted, just stuff like that. Where it's like you know. You almost have no choice. Even if it's my last, per se, or the last that I can give away, you don't want to see somebody out of a job or out of a home or, you know, if there's an opportunity that they have that you know it's going to, looks like it could be successful, I'll try to pitch in. So, you know, I try to be there for people if need be. My rule about lending money is never lend something that you expect to get back. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and most of the time I've given it away, I probably haven't. But I walked into it knowing, you know. Right. I might not get it, it back. It was, wasn't more so a loan. It was more so a, a help. A help. Yeah. So what did your mom teach you about money growing up? Like, what are some things that you remember that she told you? Or did you guys discuss it at all? Yeah. So it's interesting. Great question. It's interesting because what I learned from my mom, I learned from watching. What I learned from my grandmother, I learned from her telling me. So my grandmother was very direct. Uh, she was, I would say, like, comfortable in her own space. So she was able to teach us as we went along. So she would always be like, you know, if I was getting my in income tax check back, you know, early on, first job, she'd be like, what are you doing with that money? Are you <laughs> saving it? You know, put it towards this so you could get a car later on and get a house. She was the first one that made me buy a car, you know, save for a car, mm -hmm. house, save for a house. She co-signed for my first car. Nice. So again, those things that I was learning along the way, my dad, he couldn't help for whatever situation he was in. So mm -hmm. my grandmother uh, co-signed for my car. I was, you know, young, 19, 20 something like that. So again, learning, oh, wow, your credit has to be in order for somebody to help, you know, co-sign you and stuff like that. So again, I learned from like my mom and my dad, not really them telling me, teaching me lessons, but watching the lessons of sometimes what to do or what not to do. Mm -hmm. And then my grandmother was really always on me about putting my money towards something. So you had a job at a young age because you bought a car when you were like 19? Yes, I had a job at a young age. Um, and I just, oh, I, st I my first job was in the hospital. Uh, that was in a program in the Bronx. 
I was at um, Lenox Hill Hospital as a histotechnologist assistant. What is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they would uh, uh, search the thing for like cells, like cancer cells and okay. stuff like that. Yeah, so that was super cool. Did that for two summers. And then my dad um, worked, used to work for Frito-Lay potato chips. Mm-hmm. So he got me a job at a, a supermarket. Okay. Kind of like, you know, just some um, Doing stock, a display stock kind and, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where I learned like responsibility and I kind of moved up in the rank over there. I was there for like two, three years. Uh, and that's where I learned to also develop relationships with my managers and all the rest of the employees. And it, it was really cool. All right. So then let's talk about you entering <clears throat> this music industry business. Mm-hmm. So your first job, you did like street team promotions? First job was street team promotions. It was an internship, of course. Um, that led into a, a real um, head of promotions. Was it a paid internship uh, or did that exist? It did, but like for transportation and food. Okay. There was nothing really for like, it was like, how much does it cost for you to get here to the office and back to the Bronx every day? You know, whatever, $37 a week, food every day. Let's say you get a $5 or $10, whatever it was. <laughs> that That's what it was for. It was like food and transportation. You go to Papaya's, get you two hot dogs in the sun. <laughs> we used to, either that or we used to stay in, uh, especially early Rockefeller days, <laughs> we used to go to Popeye's because the Popeye's had the two ninety nine deal for <laughs> Two piece chicken, biscuit, fries, and a drink. Wow! For two ninety nine. That's insane. All of us used to get that. And BBQ every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now BBQ is next level. Okay. No, so that's interesting. So you were only getting like a per diem or getting yep. reimbursed yeah. for your travel and expenses, but you were okay with doing that and not getting a salary. I was one hundred okay, one hundred percent okay with doing that because the music business is all I wanted since a youngster, since 12, 13, 14. So even going into high school. My whole plan was to try to get in the music business however way that I can. Once I get my way in there, I'll learn what the different departments are, and I'll figure it out. But my whole thing was, this is the only thing I want to do in life. I'm going to figure it out. You know, it may take me a little longer because I'm uneducated, and I've never worked in the business, but as long as I get my shot, mm-hmm. I'll prove that I'm meant to be there. So, All right, so you start working for the street team. Mm-hmm. Now, at first, was this Bad Boy? Bad Boy was first, yes. Correct. Okay, so you got your foot in the door there. So what Super was that Mario, like? Yep, Super Mario got me in the door. That was great. I was only there a year. Um, you know, people have heard the story here and there, but basically I wanted to leave there because I felt like I hadn't really helped build what they had. They had this phenomenal company that was explosive, Mm -hmm. that had the best artists in the world, in the country, you know, in music, period. Uh, But they had established it already. I came in after that was done. I wanted to go somewhere where I could help be a part of that team, just like Bad Boy was. I wanted to be a part of that from the beginning. That's amazing that at such a young age, you knew that you wanted to help build something new rather than be at what was Mm -hmm. hot right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Again, I'm not saying that like back then this was the whole plan. Like, yeah, uh, they already did this. I want to, but in a sense, that's just what I felt. I felt I didn't. I didn't feel 100% comfortable, mm-hmm. right? And what I mean by comfortable is I didn't want to take credit that wasn't mine. You know, and usually if you're down with a team, right, you're all yelling the same thing. You're all rooting for the same thing. And I hadn't put in the work that a lot of those guys had, so I wanted to do that somewhere. All right, so talk about now uh, moving over to Rockefeller. How did that opportunity come about? Opportunity came about uh, moving to Rockefeller because I knew a guy named Ray Ray who did uh, radio promotions, and I had dealt with Ray Ray in the past. Uh, He was at Penalty Records or something like that. And so we developed a relationship, and then I heard when Rockefeller Records started, Ray Ray went over there to do radio promotion. So I was like, oh, that's my guy. Like, I'm (laughs) in. So whatever, long story short, I go, he gets me a meeting. I kind of get denied um, because they recognized me, Damon J. Biggs. They recognized me from like the bad boy street team days. Mm-hmm. And they basically, they just like, they were trying, they thought I was still with them and they were trying to build a new team right. with new people, with new, you know. And uh, I was like, yo, I quit. I'm telling you, I'm not <laughs> there anymore. <laughs> they, thought I was, they thought I was trying to double dip. They thought I was trying to double dip. Yeah. So um, anyway, got past that, got the opportunity. And when I went in there, instead of being like on the street team, I was head of the street team along with my partner, Bert. So we were heads of the street team. We got to recruit people now the same way Super Mario recruited us. So that was cool. And then from there, I went straight into A&R after that, about a year and a half later. You know what I'm hearing is how important your relationships were to get you into the position that you were in. Because even for you going to work for Bad Boy and then going over to Rockefeller, Mm -hmm. it was a lot of that was based off of you know this person. Correct. And they were able to plug you. So it is important for you to establish yourself in a positive manner to people so that they can vouch for you. Absolutely. That was my main focus, uh, going to industry events, 
seminars, concerts, you know, whatever the case may be outside the radio station. I wanted people uh, to get people familiar with my face. Who is this guy? Why is he always here? What does he do? I wanted to familiarize everybody with my face. From there, I'll meet them, trying to get some conversations going. But my whole thing was like, develop the relationships. Right. All right. So now you could have never anticipated Rockefeller blowing up the way that it did. And you were there from the beginning. I did think Jay was going to be probably one of the biggest ever. I didn't think, obviously, he'd be this big. I mean, he's one of the most massive people, right? But um, yeah, I did have the foresight. I thought he, I was a big, humongous Jay-Z fan. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know what I'm saying, from what they had when they started, I thought they were really going to go far and I just wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be a helping hand. Now, during this time, what was the biggest check that you got early on? Early on, the biggest check I got. So early on, you know, it was very, yeah, it was, it was very hard. It was very light. Limited. Um, <laughs> I can attest. The same guy, Ray Ray. So this is cool because this kind of now integrates my love uh, and hobby of photography. So Ray Ray, who was the same guy who was doing radio promotion, he was looking at my pictures one day and was like, "Man, these are like incredible. Like you could, you could probably sell these." In my mind, I have zero idea that I could sell anything to anybody. One, I don't have those relationships at publications. Two, I didn't even think that was a thing. You know, again, I'm not saying ignorant, but I'm learning as I go. Oh, He's like, going to take you to the guy named Riggs at the source. Takes me over there. Uh, I bring like 20 pictures probably. And it's like random, you know, Ja Rule in the studio. This person and that person. Mm-hmm. This person, Kevin Lyle, talking to whomever, right? Uh, and the guy comes back and he's like, cool, I'll take, I'll take these 17. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I, you know what I mean? I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but he was like, I could only do, you know, $40 a picture. You know what I mean? And right. I'm like, what? That's $680. What? <laughs> this guy's going to pay me? Yeah, so that was super cool. Obviously, I was super cool with everybody who was in those photos. So I kind of got to show them Kevin Lyles and Jay. and You know what I mean? Because I never wanted to exploit anybody. Right. So I made sure know. people saw them and cool. And they were like to go like in the back of the Source magazine. They had that little section right. of like what, was, what happened that month. Yeah, yeah spotted. <laughs> so... For me, like a check like that, that came out of the blue that I had no idea uh, you could even, you know, prosper off of was like incredible. What are some things that you learned about business and partnerships and investments working at Rock? That you have to speak up for yourself. Uh, uh, You miss, you know, 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Uh, And again, that goes along with my other, uh, another quote that I love living by, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. And, you know, you can't think that things are going to come to you because you deserve them. You can't think they're going to come to you because you think people are going to do the right thing. And it's not about them not doing the right thing. It's about, you know, closed mouths don't get fed. You have to kind of speak up for what you want, for what you're going for, uh, whether it's price, whether it's whatever it is, like you have to make sure that you're good because most people won't. Mm-hmm. Make sure they're not going to offer it to you. Why? You have to ask for it. It's just like a promotion with a telephone that you had no idea. Like, oh, if you call in three days prior, you can get international for free for two weeks. Like, nobody's going to, you have to kind of like ask, you know what I mean? Like, do you have any promotions uh, for international traveling? Like, if not, <laughs> no, nobody's going to offer you Right, those they're not going to be like, we got to make sure we <laughs> change this uh, bill, lower the price. Exactly. You know, you're so right about that because I remember reading an article about how women don't ask for raises enough mm-hmm. because a lot of times it company, you know, sometimes there's like a standard that they do, but unless you go in there and you make the case for this is why I deserve this raise and this is what I'm asking for and you can do your research and see what the market value is of your position, then why would they just do that for you? And so, you know, can you talk about occasions where you have actually went and said, hey, you know, we're working on this deal and I want to, I want it. I think um, me being like humble and, and nice, I don't like to kind of push anything too hard. So like, I never asked for like raises or I've got raises. Mm-hmm. I've never asked for them. I've never asked for, uh, to Do you be, negotiate when they come to you? Like, Hey, here's your raise. Well, actually I was thinking more like this. Well, now I have a manager, so it's different. It's right. So you Aaron, don't want to have to talk, Aaron, have that conversation yourself. Talk to <laughs> no, Aaron, Aaron Ailes handles everything. For me. <laughs> but even then, like even, um, a promotion, I never, you know, I would see my peers, go from VP to SVP to EVP to the, and I would be at SVP for the same amount of time mm-hmm. that they went up three notches. I don't have an ego. I don't care. So I never really push for that stuff, but I see that it matters, right? Because mm-hmm. it matters to other people. My mind has always been so much on helping others, pushing the, uh, the culture forward, you know, being a good guy, being somebody that, you know, you can count on and you can lean on. I never really took the time to be like, well, I need this and I want this and I... 
but you've actually done some things now. And because, look, at the end of the day, you are setting yourself up and your family, your children up for the future, yeah. too. And that's part of it also. Right. And to also feel appreciated, because I think sometimes we can be a little bit angry or like, how come this didn't happen mm -hmm. for me? But we didn't ask for it. You're right. You know, and, that, that's what's happening and it feels so good when you actually do ask for it and you get it. That's why that comes back to you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. Right. Because mm -hmm. I've put deals together for certain people, friends, associates, and I'm thinking, oh, they made 700000 they, they should hit me up. They, 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 yeah. they, they might. They might I, not even like they should, but they I'm, should, sure they, I'm sure they would. I'm sure. And I've done stuff like that where nothing's come back. And again, that's not their fault at all. At all. I should have. Yeah. You should have put that I in the deal. You should have been like, look, exactly, I want 10%, exactly. you know, if I make this happen, because that is something. And again, when I say that, I don't mean it in a, you it's know, business, in, in a way of regretting anything. Anybody I helped, I did it with pleasure and I didn't want nothing back. But I can't lie. As a human being, I have thought sometimes, well, they made 1.3 off this. I'm sure right. I'll get a wallet or a dinner. A wallet. You know what I'm no, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being <laughs> A funny, wallet with a check in it. Some, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you're but sometimes those things don't come through. Right? You, gotta you be are absolutely there. right about that. And sometimes people don't think about that. And But that is a lesson for all of us yeah. to know that when we are the person that's mediating a deal... Make sure you write yourself into that because right. you're bringing relationships, and relationships do cost money. Cost money. You know they can. They cost now. There's certain years. times. There's certain times when you are doing things just because it's somebody that's really yeah. close to you. Maybe there's not a lot of money involved, and you're like, just keep that. I'm good. Or yeah. they've done a lot of things for you, so you don't feel like you should. But there are times when this is business. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you know for sure this is going to be like pretty lucrative, you should, you know, work yourself into it if you can. Now, can you talk about a situation? Because I know recently I've seen you a lot with this tequila. <laughs> yeah, so that's a oh, good question. Um, Lobo's tequila, uh, LeBron James, uh, Diego, Dia, Aaron, um, Maverick, Rich. So that's their tequila. Um, great tequila, by the way. Mm -hmm. And again, right, good question because... Now, later in life, knowing about investments and knowing about, you know, getting in on the rounds of certain, you know, products and stuff like that, you can do. Before, I never had any clue or any idea. Ten, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I didn't know, oh, you can put money into this product and then early on. if it goes early on. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so now that's a good thing about having these relationships. Now, instead of just being an ambassador for Lobos, I can be like, hey, can we, can I get in? Can I get in a round or two? And I was able to get in and invest in Lobos and... Proud. So it's like not only am I an ambassador, friend of the brand, you know, uh, ambassador of the brand, I'm also an investor in the brand. I can't wait till I see you at another dinner and we toast to that <laughs> with some Lobos. Let's do it. Let's do a, <laughs> like a Friendsgiving situation. Not them, but I mean something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm always down for a nice toast with Lenny S. Yes. Now, you're also a big advocate for artists and yes. ownership and making sure that uh, they get what they deserve. So Absolutely. can you talk to me about advice you would give to young artists right now that are, you know, the game has changed so much yeah. from when we both first got into it. Uh, advice to young artists, I would say, you know, go with what you're comfortable with. And to even create a comfortable space for you to do or make the right business deal that you want to or the business situation that works for you is creating leverage. And creating leverage is, right, getting out there, making your own, you know, waves and making your own mark in the music business or whatever it is you're doing so that, you know, labels, com production companies, they're coming to you. And when they're coming to you, you actually have the leverage now. So whether you want to be independent and kind of take, you know, more of the back end on your own or if you want to get with a label, I think it's just making that mark so that you have the option and then you can weigh your options out because independent isn't for everybody and being in a label isn't for everybody. So I think you create what you need in order to make the decision that works best for you. Now, when it comes to artists, right, that, because obviously you deal with a lot of artists, you do management as mm -hmm. well. When they ask you about investments, what kind of advice do you give? The advice, the advice I give for investments is I go right to Jay Brown. <laughs> Jay, Brown. <laughs> Jay Brown is a genius, uh, mm -hmm. he and Jay-Z as well. Um, and they were always up early on these things. And I mean, everything from whatever, you name it, Uber to whatever it is, Stan Socks. Like they were up early on these things and they, they're great investment guys. And, and Jay Brown, that's that's my go-to. What is one of the first investments you've ever made when you got some money? Back before, I invested like in a production company so that we could like, you know, um, make music and film and, you know, it kind of, you know, it kind of 
some of those things dwindle away. Right. But I mean, again, no regrets. People that I rocked with, trusted. We did some things. We put some things together. We put some pilots together. They go, they come, you know what I'm saying? But that was like the first thing I... But I do think one of the worst things is not to even try, right? 100%. You have to Because then you have regrets about, man, this could have happened. This didn't happen the way it should have. And it is like, sometimes I look at things that have been a loss financially as I invested in learning. Yeah. Yes. And, And I learned something from everything, from every win, every loss. I always learned something. That's something you have to experience these things, you know what I mean? Whether wins or losses, you have to go in and you have to give it your all because then you're going to feel like, you know, you're not going to know what it was like to have had the chance or to have given it the shot. If you just don't do anything about it, you're going to be looking back and later on like, damn, I should have. You'll never know. Like, right. You'll never know at all. So my thing is just go, jump, jump out the window. So you do have this uh, partnership that you've done now with Lobos Tequila. Now Mm -hmm. let's talk about something else I saw. In Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. you guys had a sneaker store, Rock and Soul, on Atlantic Avenue. Yes. It's no longer there. No longer there. So I know that having a brick-and-mortar location is really, really difficult, and there's a lot of challenges to it. And a lot of times we learn really valuable lessons from things that don't work out. So can you talk to me about the sneaker store, Rock and Soul, and what happened? Wow. There's a number of good questions today. I'm not gonna lie. And, and stuff that I was I've always never, wondering because and, and stuff that I've never spoken about. Um, there was a small little legal situation with there, so I can't get into deep detail, but I can give you enough that you know. So Rock and Soul was an amazing store. Had two partners, uh, one guy, and then and Tata was my other partner, um, and, and his sister. Uh, so three partners. I'm sorry. Um, amazing store. You've been there. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody was coming through. We had Adidas. We had all the good accounts. Puma. So everything was going Great amazing. Location Great location by the Barclays. Great location. Barclays. Two Atlantic blocks from Barclays. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't. It was amazing. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, one of the partners we had did some shady business and it kind of it kind of put us under, I'm be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's how it really went down. You know what I mean? Trusting somebody that I knew for 15 years that I trusted, that I, you know what I'm saying? And um, I had got one or two warnings about them, but I kind of ignored it. And anyway, um, before we could look up to see what was going on, it had already gone so deep that we couldn't save it. Mm-hmm. So again, business, you have to make sure you're doing business with the right people. You have to make sure the right paperwork is in order. You have to make sure that you have somebody watching the business that's going on, even with the people that you do trust. And that's just, you know, right. for a good business to make sure. And if everybody's doing what they're supposed to, right, it's going to be fine. But this is a situation where, you know, I, I kept my eyes closed and I was, you know, doing other things and I didn't pay as much as attention as I probably should have. And um, before I knew it, it was too late and it went under. So super unfortunate. Um, I love that store. It's probably, not to say the only thing, but I don't really have much failures. So it kind of, it hit, it hurts, you know what I mean? Because right. You know me, Ange. I go hard mm-hmm. with whatever I do. I don't care if it's an artist, if it's a, if it's a label, if it's a jo- whatever job, whatever thing I have in front of me, I give it a million percent, and I usually come on top. So to have something like that full, you know, go under, it should hurt, you know, right. especially because it was somebody I trusted. Yeah, that's so important because I have partners in a lot of my businesses too. And how do you decide or how can you even predict who's a good yeah. partner? Sometimes you really just can't. But like you said, you can pay attention to some of those warning signs yeah. and make sure that your contracts and agreements are in order too to protect yourself, right? Correct, correct. And, and that's the thing. I don't regret it in a sense because I would have done it differently. Mm-hmm. I trusted the guy, you know what I mean? Right. But I was supposed to stay on top of it. And, you know, you can trust and still do checkups. You know? Did that make you more, a little bit more apprehensive about doing investments? Absolutely. Because, you know, I put I put my real money. He didn't put no money, so he didn't lose nothing. You know, I, you know something I learned? When people don't put money hmm. into something, they don't treat it the same as they would have if they did. Yeah. And it's really hard to do business with people when they're not as invested as you are because they're not going to lose anything. Yeah. And when they have nothing to lose, I learned that personally from yeah. having to deal with people who said, I'll just put in my sweat equity. Yes. But it doesn't really matter if they don't have anything at stake. Exactly. The only thing I really felt bad for, and it, it actually, like, shit made me cry, real shit, is, I'm sorry, I'm cursing, I'm not supposed to be, um, <laughs> made me cry. It was Tata. You know what I mean? Because, like, Tata invested with me, and then, you know, for him to take that loss. And by the way, that's my brother for life. I would die for the guy. I think the same. He would do the same for me. He looked at me in my eyes and was like, don't even worry about it. It wasn't your fault. You know, next thing. We'll get the next thing. 
But still, like, it made me feel bad that having him and he was a bystander got caught, you know, with a guy that I vouched for right. and then the business went. So that that's the only thing that really made me. As far as me and my money, the money will come back, it's whatever, you know what I'm saying? It was unfortunate, but I was I more so felt like, you know, bad that I dragged Tata into it. Well, Lenny S., thank you so much. This has been great. We've had a whole different type of conversation. And and, thank you, thank you, thank and you. And I thank you for being this. so honest, too, because I know the whole point of doing this is that for some people, talking about money feels so taboo. Yeah. And we want to normalize these conversations. And Absolutely. so people can sit around and talk about, you know, when I had my first job, I was making $23,000 a mm. year. And that was me negotiating up. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I also feel it's important because, like, just like, and I know you're wrapping up, but I look at it like art. You know, our people are also intimidated by art. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's expensive. It looks like I can't afford it, but you can. Just like you can buy a piece for $2 million or $20 million, you can buy a piece for $200. Yeah. That can grow into that. So same with money. I feel like money, people are intimidated by money, and we have to normalize that. Yeah, I've been investing in art lately, too. And what I learned is I don't invest in art thinking, okay, can I flip this and sell it? Yeah. I just buy things that I love and yep. that speak to me. And when I look at it, I'm like, that looks amazing. And then it appreciates. And, and then it hopefully, value. You know, yeah. it may Usually. or it may not, but I'm keeping it in my house. Exactly. So regardless, you know, and listen, and there are people who do that because they want to try and flip it. And mm -hmm. everything is a risk, no matter what it is that you do. When it comes to money, nothing is for sure. That's right. But take the risk. Yeah. So take the risk. No That's risk, good advice, no Lenny S. <laughs> All right, Lenny S., we are here and we are about to do rapid fire with uh -oh. you. So you just answer these questions I'm ready. as fast as you can. Let's go. Okay. What was the first concert you bought tickets to? Big Daddy Kane. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. My uh, favorite. What did you spend your first big check on? Car. What yeah. kind of car was it? It was a Denali. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, gray, gray Denali. And everybody at the office used to call me Holly Denali. Oh, right. I thought that was Hollywood, yeah. <laughs> what did you spend your last big check on? Investing in Lobos. What's the best money move you ever made? House. Houses. I agree. For my kids. Yeah, my house, my kids' house. What is the greatest money lesson you've learned? To, to make sure that you're 100% on top of every intricacy of the business that you're in so that you don't, so that it doesn't go under. What's the worst money advice you ever got? Stocks and stuff that I had uh, no idea about, and, and they didn't even really know about it. It's just like something that just they Just get had, it. Everybody else heard, is doing yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> like, like a wave or I something. I got a tip. Yeah. <laughs> When do you feel empowered by money? Uh, I feel empowered by money when um, you know what, because it doesn't it doesn't hinder like what you want to do. You know what I mean? Like with money, you could really get what you need to get accomplished. Whereas like when you don't have money or capital, you kind of feel lost and hope and helpless. You know we know I mean? both feelings. Yeah. Don't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I felt both ways. <laughs> and isn't it great when you can get your kids whatever it is that they want, or you can be and like, then, yeah, go ahead, take what you need. Exactly. I got it. <laughs> and that's all I wanted because I didn't have that. What's your favorite thing to spend money on? Um, yeah, entertainment. You, entertainment. I was like, what do you buy? What do you yeah, spend your money I'm a, on? I'm a sneakerhead. I buy every release. I'm getting these slides today. These easy slides just dropped today. I'm speaking to <laughs> I all saw my you connects. Make a yeah. I saw you on the phone with it. <laughs> that was Damson. Damson just hit me. He's like, I need the black slides. I'm like, bro. Um, but yeah, probably uh, sneaker collection and entertainment. So like anything music, movie related. What's your least favorite thing to spend money on? Plane tickets. I don't <laughs> know. Yeah, it's just I got to fly every week. So it's yeah. like the prices are like just for no reason. It's dumb. That's why I appreciate you being here. I know you had to rearrange some things. Absolutely. Um, what's your money advice to 20-year-old Lenny S? To hold back a little bit, save more like my grandmother told me to. You know, I did a little bit, but I didn't do a lot. Um, because of the business we're in, we know how to hustle. So I've always done that, which doesn't help me saving, right? Because I could not save and then be like, oh, I need, uh, I'm making this up, 50000 to put down in this house. And I'll go hustle hard for six, eight weeks, you know, and like get it. Whereas like... If I'd have just saved properly, I would have to be running and scrambling. hustling. So you're scrambling. But at least you have the ability. So planning, planning. At least ability. you have the ability to hustle like that, yeah. though, and be like, I got to get this. That's why I feel nobody should lose. Like, <laughs> nobody, like, I have, I feel like we all have hustler mentalities. And the people that don't is like, what are you, I know I can do this. I'm uneducated and from the Bronx. Like, I, you, I can do it. You could definitely do it. Lenny S., do not call yourself uneducated. No, I don't mean that's like not an true. insult. I'm, I mean, like, I went not. to high school. I went to high school. That was it. Yeah, I'm but there's all different types of education. And yeah. the education that you have is just not the traditional. Have life education. Yeah, but you know, so School I just don't college. like you even saying that. Sorry. So, yeah, I just mean I didn't go to, I didn't, I wasn't fortunate enough to go to college. I wish I could have. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but look at, where, look at where you are. Yeah, thank you. 
Angela. And last but not least, what is your best money advice to somebody on their come up? Best money advice is to invest in yourself um, and anything that you believe in. Trust me, it's going to go farther than you think. Oh, well, I love to hear it. And thank you so much for joining me and for thank having you. this uh, conversation about money. I really appreciate you. It was it was a lot that I learned about you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. I've told you things that I've never spoken about before, uh, but that's what it's about, right? Being vulnerable and kind of just letting people know your story so that they, you know, they know that they can push forward. All right. I'm ready to invest with Lenny F. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ann. I'm Angela Yee, and thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you hit me up on Twitter, on Instagram, at Acorns, and let me know who you'd like me to talk to next about one of my favorite topics, money. All right, now let's get to the business. Listen up. These conversations do not reflect the views of Acorns. The material is only informational. It's not investment advice. It's not a recommendation, an offer, or sale of securities. Remember that investing involves risk, which includes the loss of principal. We always tell you that. Investment advisory services offered by Acorns Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are provided to clients of Acorns by Acorns Securities, LLC, an SEC-registered broker-dealer and member at FINRA SIPC. For more information, visit acorns.com.